So um, this is going to be a bit weird. I'm introducing myself, but uh, we thought it would be easier. So I'm going to be giving the next talk. Um, I'm based in central Johannesburg at Fitz University, where I head um, a research and policy unit called Zincha. Um, my major interest has actually previously been in access to HIV services um, and health systems research that um, translates into these national programs and most recently involved in the introduction of dolutegravir and studying TAF. Um, I look at treatment optimization studies where we try and just get drugs that, that are safer and cheaper into, into Africa, into, into um, low middle income countries. Um, also working on patient linkage to care interventions, which Cleona has talked about, um, and HIV and more recently COVID self-testing projects. Um, I've led large HEPA programs focused on different populations, including men, women, children, young people, trackers, sex workers, and people from the LGBTI community. In the last 20 years, been advised to major, uh, several major um, groups in terms of guidelines. Also been involved in several human rights cases, and I have an active interest in medical uh, ethics. And I'll be giving the next talk looking at are managing these patients in the sort of low middle income country um, environment. Hi everybody, thanks for inviting me to give this talk on MDR versus HIV resistant patients um, in low middle income countries. Um, these are my disclosures. Most of this talk is actually going to be a bit of a history lesson because we've moved into an integrated inhibitor era and the new lessons are going to be, have to be learned over the next few years around this class of drugs. But the environment era has firmly come to an end. And that's what I'm going to unfortunately talk to you about in the first half of the lecture. Just to remind you that the epidemic is very concentrated in sub Saharan Africa, and as you'd expect, that's also where we're going to see a lot of the drug resistant issues. The features of most low middle income countries, with a few exceptions, is that they have very limited access to viral load monitoring. Um, many countries are lucky to provide the patients with a single viral load in, in history. And that operates for large chunks of Africa, but also for the Americas and for much of Asia. And again, as you'd expect, there's very limited genotype testing outside of um, certain research facilities and third, certain third line programs. You could um, ask yourself whether we actually need much genotyping as the WHO approach studies like Ernest have demonstrated that actually you don't really need it, certainly for sequencing between first and second line. Public health approach, which has been so successful where, um, with WHO leading the field, the pack in terms of the guidelines, has meant necessarily that we have a very limited number of drugs in the country, so less to get resistance to. And as you all know as well, as the, by definition, low middle income countries are very cost sensitive, which meant that we've had limited access to protease, and particularly to protease inhibitors, but certainly to other drugs, which are many times more expensive. So the question is, do these patients, these multicodes patients, actually exist? And it's actually very hard to find them. Um, there was very little mono and dual therapy during the 90s and 2000s in low middle income countries, like we were in richer countries. Um, single dose nevirapine has been hasn't been used for almost a decade now in most of these countries. And we, as I said, we have very limited access to proteins. It's an opportunity to get this drug resistance, multi-drug resistance, certainly was very limited. Um, the data I'm going to talk, talk about here, uh, pre data actually showed that you know, drug circulation was certainly other than to NRTIs and to, occasionally to NRTIs was actually very limited and very limited to private practice sites and little pockets in Africa and, and South America and Asia often relate to unregulated access to, to various antiretrovirals. Um, also to note that, uh, that resistance was falling in, in, in richer countries during this time. So the limited data I could find, which is a little bit dated from five years ago, showed that only a tiny proportion of low middle income country patients had multi-drug resistance and were on third line program. And you can see a smattering of, of regimens there at the bottom, many of which these patients came from countries like South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, and Zambia. Um, and again, as you'd expect, it would depend on which drug they had access to uh, that made up these regimens. Um, if Favrins has been very, very well tolerated actually, but its weakling is not just its side effect profile and its drug interactions, but also the fact that it's incredibly easy to break, um, as with its, its predecessor in the very peak. The newer NRTIs are, are easier to use. We've moved patients off the fabrins once they fail, both biologically or in some cases clinically or immunolo immunologically. And this combination of AZT and, um, and usually um, Aluvia, but increasingly Etzanavir, 
Um, then that's, you know, what was shown in the earlier studies that this movement across was very, very um, potent and very successful. That was very expensive, as Lawrence Long showed in the paper a couple of years ago. It was 2.4 times more expensive. And then the third line drugs, which were as many as 10 to 15 times more expensive than the first line. So the challenge to many African countries is that they're showing increased NRTR resistance, driven largely by patients re-entering the system, not truly naive patients. Often stockouts of singles, meaning that it's, um, in conditions like TB, where you have to double those um, particular protease inhibitors, um, patients were often having their resistance profile driven by the fact that they couldn't have their, their drugs increased in, in, um, in terms of drug number because they didn't have sufficient as I said, particularly in South Africa, we're seeing with the protease of the TB. So many of these countries across Asia, Africa, and the Americas start demonstrating steadily increased in an RTI resistance process, um, which is one of the primary reasons why Dolitegui was recommended in, in the new WHO guidelines. These slightly dated studies from across South Africa demonstrate that when people do fail first line through, the, they fail with exactly the mutations for, um, in our time, mutations of primary and analog mutation, occasional K65 R, it's not fair mutation, that you'd expect on programs that were at the time D14 AZT based. Red panels demonstrated that these in our time mutations were associated with, um, with poor outcomes in terms of, of patients who were um, who had pre treated in our time resistance and then were start on in our times. Although there was data, a very um, provocative study coming out of um, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa from Dean and Pillay's group at Matuba Tuba, demonstrating that even though they did see this rising in our tower resistance, they didn't see poor virological outcomes. And this probably was a consequence of poor socioeconomic status masking the biological consequences of the NNRTIs. Um, it does, however, build on advanced in Cape Town data, which demonstrates that even in the presence of NNRTI based regions, you can often get um, resuppression of these patients with a focused adherence um, um, intervention. But we here to talk about multi-drug resistant patients. And in second line failure, the patients do tend to go through this failure targeted intervention um, in terms of adherence, but then confirmed um, biological failure, which then earns them genotype. And in South Africa, we use this hodgepodge of, of using this genotype to kind of design a patient's regimen with Derunavir being the basis for it and, Dol and Dolitegvir. And we were remarkably successful in this. Um, Derunavir obviously used because of the, it is such a powerful and potent um, protease inhibitor, and which has shown to be near impossible to break in studies in the Efavarins era in, in richer countries. Um, and checking the South African third line program, we, where we had over 3,000 patients, we achieved very high rates of resuppression during using this to renovate the Dolitegra um, Occasionally we use the Traverine and then tinkering with the, the, the nucleoside backbone. And um, we've got very high suppression rates. And you can read about this um, paper in, in JADES, which we were just published a few years ago. Um, so very good, um, once you do have access to viral types, even in the context of multiple resistance, you can get excellent resuppression rates. So when we hit 2018 in the Dom era, we could see that we had predictably a multi-drug resistance. Um, um, there was resistance um, in first line, but multi-drug resistance is actually very um, unusual, even on second line. And when it did happen, it was pretty predictable. First, second, and third line resistance was very predictable. We were seeing this worrying rise in our tower resistance, um, but the C WHO sequencing the blind sequencing to a protease inhibitor that demonstrated from earnest was that it actually worked. Um, this demonstrated that third line was really needed, um, but needed genotype to develop the accurately. And that with that combination, you got pretty good results. Again, it was only really possible in middle income countries like South Africa and countries like other middle income countries like Botswana, Brazil, um, Zambia, and, and, and Namibia. But now that Dolitegravir has come, and I've talked about Dolitegravir specifically, because Dolitegravir is really still only available in rich countries, but it is a very similar analog. We have data suggests you can't use it in TV, and we don't have as much um, pregnancy data. But the integrated inhibitors, Dolitegravir has completely changed this idea around multiple resistance patients. And 
has moved into first, second, and third line WHO guidelines very firmly over the 2008-2019 period. Um, it was amazingly enough cheaper than Efavirenz initially, and in fact, this 2018 um, combination of Nafolio, Pritzi, and Dolitegra has dropped to just over $60 now. Um, so we were actually able to get um, a drug that for the first time is cheaper and better than its predecessor. The Fabrin's cost has also dropped um, with it, so the Fabrin's combination is probably actually relatively similar. But it's fallen away in most of our countries, um, certainly across Africa, where it's not for the 3GC and Bolotigo combination first lines completely um, eclipsed the Fabrin's based combination. And you've seen this massive dose of Bolotigo, partly because now we're reassured that it's safe in pregnancy and that you can actually use it in TV as a double dose or you could just go back to all of the fabrics. And this has meant this massive switch across to TLD. Um, and millions, tens of millions of people, in fact, have now transitioned in Africa across to the region. This Africa was chaotic, it happened during COVID times, and a lot of patients were moved across without virological um, confirmation of virological suppression. So there's going to be an interesting natural experiment that's happened. So Dabotegra didn't come, it's a safer drug, it's got less side effects, less drug interactions with contraception, but it's also got this unbelievable um, genetic barrier. And the study I was associated with, um, which a lot of attention has been paid to the weight gain on the study, in many ways, another very interesting aspect was that the patients who failed Dabotegra, so these were routine patients recruited from programs in central Johannesburg, almost all the Dabotegra patients resuppressed um, a lot of the Fabrin's patients did as well, but Dolotegravir patients resuppressed, and even the ones who did fail, the very, very small numbers that failed, had no resistance mutations, suggesting that, you know, the, that an adherence intervention here is, again, probably the only thing we actually require in first line. And again, questioning where resistance actually is going to emerge um, in these patients. So this is, you know, as I said, a history lesson. History is being written as we speak now, and we just don't have much data to, to, um, to, to suggest that actually this is an issue. So it's a non-sexy stuff that we're going to have to do now, which is paying attention to explaining patient regimens, trying to simplify regimens, which again is getting easier and easier in the Dolotegra era, trying not to minimize side effects, but also trying to pay attention to them. And again, in advance, we had almost no patients. We didn't have a single patient stop on Dolotegra because of side effects. Promoting routine in terms of the tablet taking, promoting social support, paying attention to alcohol and other substance use where appropriate, and then addressing mental health issues. And this stuff, which is much harder to do than focus on which tablet we use, is probably going to become even more important, even though it was pretty important in the Fabrin's era. We're seeing the emergence of the injectable era, and certainly in low and middle income countries where you know, the injectables seem certainly the early um, generation of them are going to require very high um, attention to adherence and to the program delivery of these programs are going to be a big challenge for them and have the ability to potentially drive multi drug resistance in the future if we don't pay attention to the system. We've seen the slow extinction of lots of, um, of ARVs. I don't think any of us are sorry to see the, the loss of the thymidine analogs, all the two drugs, and most of these horrible protease inhibitors, and the old generation of integrase inhibitors, which didn't add very much. Efavirenz, which is steadily becoming less and less used, there's a big debate about whether we need to not be in TAF, except for hepatitis B patients, in terms of dual therapy becoming the standard of care study, and there's, as I said, a huge debate about that. And then we look with keen interest at the ARIA and ARTS studies, which are hopefully going to be presented at this conference, um, which may mean that AZT steadily falls away, or at least for many patients, as we go forward. So in conclusion, um, we're not even certain with the integrase inhibitor errors with Dorinibia as a backup, where the resistance is actually going to be a thing. You know, is this just going to be a, an old legacy of, of, of the various integrase, uh, of the various regimens that we've used? Without that, we've got these phenomenally potent regimens. Is, res is resistance going to be anything more than something we worry about keeping a public health eye on? Um, we look at drugs that, um, like lenocapavir and, and islatavir, and these drugs appear to be as potent as, and, um, and these, the, these current generation of drugs. So again, we may not be worrying too much about resistance in the future, but more worrying is the, the system of care that's provided. It actually means that we can use these drugs responsibly. And I think finally is that 
potency and tolerability is not actually the major reason you're going to be worrying about patients failing in the, in the future. It's all about the social determinants of health around poverty, mental health, substance use, the life care also affects all of us, probably not just poor people. Um, and that addressing these social determinants, we knew they were important in the a era, but they can become even more um, important in low and middle income countries where these issues are unaddressed in many of our countries, even more so than they are in the richer countries. So resistance is just important to address and to pay attention to, but shouldn't distract us from the fact that these other issues are every bit as important. Thank you for your attention. And thank you to my amazing team in Johannesburg who um, have done so much of the work that we, we are so proud of. So thank you everybody for sitting there through that. Um, I, um, I'm going I'm to welcome back Kiona and Dave and, and just ask you to please start keep sending your questions through. We've got a couple, some legacy questions from the previous two presentations. Um, I think both of them electrified you. Um, so. David's got some questions which he wants to ask, and I'm just going to quickly curate some of the others so we can move straight into this. Thanks very much indeed, Francois. I mean, I think that's a wonderful overview. My question, given WHO guidelines, which I've only just glanced at, were published over the weekend, and if they come every couple of years, last were 2019, do you see Dolly Tegave 3TC versus TLD? I just wanted to see your sort of perception of going forward in the next one or two years of Dolly, you know, um, the, the three drug versus the true, the two drug. So it's difficult to get past the, the, the pharmacy wars of the companies having their own, like, you know, arguments about these things. Yep. Locally, there is a debate. So in my situation, Tenofovir, I did my PhD on Tenofovir. I, I think it's a remarkably safe drug. Um, I'm not clear about what TAF does to obesity levels. I think it's still a difficult question. Um, and whether it's tenofovir blunts obesity, you know, the gaining of weight, or whether it, um, whether TAF supersizes you, know, it isn't, to my mind, totally clear at the moment yet. And we do, certainly in my environment, get the free hepatitis B addition. The cost of tenofovir on top of the $60 is actually very small. So a lot of people are saying, you know, who cares? Let's just leave the tenofovir on board of whatever background nuke you've got. We're moving into the age of the injectables. Let's rather focus on looking at that. I flip-flop between those, those views quite often. Um, I don't like giving drugs unnecessarily. And we do occasionally, you know, have patients, and particularly those taking supplements, ending up with renal failure. And I'm sure it's not, it's a bit like an aminoglycoside that if you have normal kidneys, it's absolutely fine. But if they're a bit damaged and you add to Nofavir on top of it, it's probably not going to end well. So I don't know how what you guys are thinking on your side of the world. Um, I know WHO had a spirited discussion a few weeks ago, which I couldn't be at. So yeah, I'd love to hear your views. Cleone, Cleone what do you think in terms of... Uh... Uh, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm really coming back to what we said earlier. I'm, you know, taking the, the, the tortoise approach and, and waiting and being patient. I'm really excited about the injectables. Um, because they will offer significant benefits for the particular group of patients that I work um, with. And, and having worked pre-integrase inhibitors and post-integrase inhibitors, I agree, Francois, it's really been revolutionary. You know, we used to have these resistance meetings where we'd be trying to think about what are we going to give this patient to keep them going? Um, and, you know, you're patching and patching and patching. And basically, we, we just don't need to do that. It's such a luxury. Um, and... Uh, we would have, again, working with a lot of drug users who would have adherence issues, uh, NNRTIs weren't an option, and they had a lot of side effects with boosted PIs. So I, I have to say I'm a, a Dalyuteg Revere fan. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see, I think, on two versus three drugs. But it does make sense. I agree, Francois. You know, if if it's something that you don't need, then why are you going to give, give it? Yeah. I, th I think it's interesting. There's been a lot of clinician resistance to going to two drugs locally at the thoughts. There's, you know, they have actually been the biggest um, impediment in terms of, of promoting. What has been useful for us is in the context of renal failure is not needing the abacavir anymore. We've managed to use the dolitegavir 3TC thing very successfully. So that's been, it's a very small number of patients, but for those patients, it's been wonderful. Mm. I mean, obviously, in your one of your final points was around the injectables and the injectables are coming, the implants are coming. Again, perception of your patient population. I'm, you know, we, we have a lot of the data from surveys, et cetera, in the US. What, what, you know, what's your own 
patient thinking they aware? I'd also love to hear from Cleona on this. My patients all, hell yes, when, when's it coming? And yeah. it's been interesting to me because, again, that the clinicians have been the biggest concern. And initially, I think it's abundance of caution, but I think they also instinctively recognize that certainly in my system where nobody gets phoned for their appointment, nobody gets followed up in a situation where, you know, particularly for treatment, where the tail of particularly cabotegravir is so, so long that the ability for these these combinations to potentially generate resistance to, you know, particularly to dolotegravir in the, in the future um, might be catastrophic. So we're spending a lot of our time trying to get the systems right to anticipating that, you know, implantables and, and injectables are the future, but we better have our systems up and working well before we start uh, using them. Unfortunately, the, there's been a lot of enthusiasm for the populations where probably they're the least equipped for, such as adolescents, where, you know, uh, suppression in our environment is so poor that that's actually the last group you know, who they desperately need it but they're the mm -hmm. last group who who probably should have access to it until we can make sure that the system of care is perfect but i'd love to hear from both of you about how you've perceived patients um wanting this so i i think there's actually pretty good enthusiasm from the, the patients that I work with um, who predominantly are people who, who inject drugs um, and have you know mental health issues and, and, and multiple severe social issues as well um, because it's just one less thing to have to think about and worry about. But you know that's in a setting from someone which I have a list of you know the hundred patients that we are actively following up and I can go out to their hostels and I know where they are and we can find them. I agree with your your concerns about really, you know, it's, it's much more about systems than it is about drugs. And perception between, you know, um, cisgender men, cisgender women, for example, in terms because of injectable contraceptions, historical, do you see any difference in perception? I, I haven't noticed any difference in perception there. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, that's that's within a quite targeted population. I wouldn't I wouldn't really be able to comment on the the population as a whole in Ireland. David, one of the questions and a very focused one is uh, certainly in my environment, we have access to rifibutin, but the design of third line regimens when somebody has TB is an absolute living nightmare. You know, you're dealing with all these drugs that have, you know, the, it, between the traveling, Darunavir and Dolotegavir all having drug in, major drug interactions. I mean, I, there does come a stage, I think, in clinical medicine where you just kind of just bit the, the farm and hope that some, one of these is going to work. Yeah. What do you do in a situation where you only have access to rifampicin-based regimens? So I think with rifampicin now, um, you know, the data clearly with Dolly Tegavir from the inspiring study is that 50, you know, 50 milligrams added is, is, is something that is both from a clinical perspective and a pharmacology, pharmacokinetic perspective that works. Um, I, I guess one of the issues going forward with, with um, is, is also the, I mean, I don't know whether rifepentin in, in terms of um, the studies with 3HP and 1HP. So there's, you know, there's differences between the, the, the two with rifepentin as well. Rifebutin, because you've got a two-way interaction and particularly with the boosted, you know, the boosted regimens, that's been, that's been the real difficult one to, to work with. Um, again, you know, in your clinical practice, what's your normal way forward? We, I mean, we're lucky enough to have rifibutin, but I know in much yeah. of the rest of Africa, but it's often the places that don't have genotyping, so they're less yeah. likely to, to, to require this. And we've been, I mean, I, I think Cleona was sort of alluding to this earlier. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of success with slowly increasing the alluvia dose, um, but doing it over weeks, you know, uh, because the tolerability issues were severe. Mm. Um, I know Gary Martins's group tried to do this kind of double dosing of Durinavir and made all their livers explode. Yep. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a it really is one of those. Luckily, it's only a, I think if I think back, we've probably only had twenty or thirty patients on our third line program that have had this issue. It's obviously catastrophic for those those that small number, but they're small enough for us to kind of have a infectious diseases person on the end of the line to try and guide them through it. Right. Yeah. 
I mean, there was an interesting difference between healthy volunteer studies and the patients as well. So there's something going on that was, you know, immune based as well. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was just, uh, you know, it was just so remarkable watching them. Uh, these these results coming through. It's yeah. and quite scary actually because they <laughs> they went quite high, yeah. which is why you know in our situation, my old professors used to say, "Stop monitoring the patients, and you'll stop worrying." So it was just <laughs> <Yeah>. quite... <laughs> don't, don't order tests that you don't want to yeah. see. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> Yes, the first thing is to admonish the junior doctor for doing the test in the first place. <laughs> now they've made it your problem. Yes. Um, so um, it's fascinating, though, how, how much more drug allergies. I, I mean, we see it with septrin, with with trimethoprim. Um, how, how drug allergies are so much more common in people with HIV. It's like as if we didn't have enough else to deal with. <laughs> now they've got more drug allergies as well. I mean, I think one of the big issues, and you know, we were talking about all these herbals and things before. Donald Rumsfeld's statement the other day, you know, which which has been played many times, if we've got the known knowns and the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And that seems to me often when we're talking about some of these things, we've got the unknown unknowns and trying to work through from there. There's a question about drug interactions with marijuana. Now, just to give you some setback, um, home use was legalized in South Africa. And we have every Tom, Dick and Cannabis International Pharma Company are trying to bring their drugs to bear. And uh, so are there any things that worry you, David, in terms of um, sort of marijuana drug interactions? The only thing that's ever worried in, is whether or not with a booster with ritonavir Kobe cystat there may be some unknown unknown effect rather than known. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with dolutegavir, it, it's a drug which has got so few drug interactions which are clinically relevant, clearly rifampicin, clearly, you know, metformin in some settings, clearly the cations. But, you know, there, there are many, many that, are, that we, we can ignore, thankfully. We've been instructed that that was our last question and that um, we're not going to get a chance to get to the others. It's just for me to thank Cleona and David for such a wonderful, wonderful um, session. I've learned so much and it's just been such a delight moderating it and having such a wonderful discussion. And thanks, David, for me allowing me to add polydoctory to my um, my lexicon yes. for the time. <laughs> I think it really was one of the things I really need to 